Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I don't know why it's not automatically recording, even whenever I click the automatic recording button, but at so least I'm it's like working. Until you show up, though, because you're the moderator. Okay. That's fine. And you know, they want to give us. That we have to make, they give us the option to opt out in case we're not okay with it. And I think that's why it has to wait until you start. Mm -hmm. You will be like, oh, I see. Then I don't have to go to the staff meeting. Yay! Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Don't yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited about today's. I, you know, it's really hard. And I'm going to tell you, next week is going to be extremely hard. It was crazy. I listened to two sermons to this morning while I was working, and both of them were referring to First John. And I'm like, oh, this is so true. It's so good. So we're going to learn a lot next week. But I don't know. Have we started? Wait a minute. Are we doing next we're, week on Thanksgiving? No. Oh, we're not. Oh, my goodness. I forgot. Next week, we won't be meeting. Oh, that's going to be so hard. I may have to do a first John regardless. I may have to do next week. I don't know. It's going to be hard. So, oh, I forgot. Next week's Thanksgiving. I keep on forgetting that. Um, do Wednesday? Oh, no. I'll miss I, it. I can't, I can't do Wednesdays or That's Tuesday it. or Monday or one of the other days. Next week. Oh, really? I'll be in New York. I'll be in New York now. Oh, uh, well, you can always watch replay if we do. Stacy, good call. I may do that. I don't know. Let me see my week is because with Black Friday and all of that. <laughs> That's the only reason I was thinking because my week is the same and I'm like, I would like a dose of sanity saving next week, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, Faith is also home all week next week, too. So let me let me see if I'll have time. If I don't, then I won't. But um, just let me figure out. Let me see. I don't know. I have to see what her plans are, too. If she can get some friends over and everything, because um, if I do any of those days, it would definitely be Tuesday. But I'll have to just see how the store ads work and stuff. So um, next week is always the week. I can never remember how ads work um, when they come out and stuff. So well, but yeah, I may. I maybe started that. everything two weeks ago, or a month ago, or this summer. And Black Friday is not really Black Friday; it's July Friday, and it's just <laughs> chaos. So it's just like, what? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is so crazy. Like, yeah. At any rate, it is. It is what it is. So, but okay, we're gonna do First Peter five today. Um, I almost. I, I was gonna pick other. I felt like a lot of them. We were going over things over and over the same things. So. I picked this one because it was just different. And so I was like, you know, we need some different in our life. And then um, we're going to go over the um, John, first John, second John and third John overview. So that way we can go over it. So we may not have as much today, but I feel like there is going to be a lot because it took me like literally five ever to do the first section of this. But then after the first section, it, it'll go quick. So which is usually the case on a lot of it. Um, does anybody want to pray us in? Anyone? I can pray. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm giving up. I'm giving other people a chance. I just want to make sure. <laughs> Our most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much, dear Lord, for this new day you've given us. We thank you for your graces and mercies that are new to us every morning. And we just thank you for the gift of life, dear Lord, that sometimes we often take for granted. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give us the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that you would open our hearts and minds to what you have to say to us, that you would speak through Shannon, um, that you would lead and guide in our discussions, dear Lord, and that you would bless this study this morning. I pray you be with each family represented here and that you would go through with us through the remainder of the week. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. I mean, then thank you, Sue. I could start doing what Sydney does at small group. She just says, uh, prayer time. Okay, I say, Charlie, you pray tonight. <laughs> and then he's like, okay. So that's what she does every week. So, um, but I won't do that to y'all. Okay. Prayer roulette. Uh, <laughs> prayer roulette. Yes, that's what she does. <laughs> that's basically what she does. And if anybody comments, she's like, okay, it's you then. <laughs> so, um, okay. When we were in the youth group and we would go out to eat, we would all raise our pinky. And whoever was the last one to raise their pinky had to pray. <laughs> oh, so like, that's a good one. <laughs> People are going to watch the recording going, why is everybody doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so Stacy, if you don't mind reading verses one through four, that would be awesome. To the elders in the flock. 
To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those who ent those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Mm. So the idea of the elder came into the church from Jewish culture, and you can see that in Exodus 3, 16, 12, 21, and 19, 7. The word elder simply speaks of the maturity and wisdom that an older person should have, making them quali qualified for leadership. It is application, um, it, it, in its application, it is more about wisdom and maturity than a specific age. So I feel like if any of y'all have elders in the church, it really shouldn't be young, like really young guys. Um, you know, there's, I, I remember listening to a pastor one time and he became a pastor, like whenever he was in his like mid twenties. And he said, I should have never been a pastor then. I should have not. I, I mean, like looking back, I was not prepared for that. I, I did not do things the right way. I, you know, and he at least saw that. And um, he saw that whenever he studied this, he said, I was not qualified. And yet people, you know, didn't call him out on that. And I thought that was really mature of him to say that because not a lot of people would say that. Um, now I'm not saying that. I, I mean, I'm just saying like, especially young in the faith, you know, there are those exceptions. There are like old souls that have, you know, somehow just like, I, I picture Spurgeon being that way, you know, just the minute they come to Christ, it's like, they just automatically have like all this wisdom and you're like, what happened? But a lot of them may have been raised in a church home, like in a family um, with Christians and just, you know, and then whenever they get it, they get it. Um, but again, it goes back to maturity and wisdom. Um, not, we were joking because one of the guys in our small group has like, he got a new haircut and we were like, you know, Ben, you could totally be a, like a music director, like a music leader in like one of those mega churches. Cause he's got the tat right there. And, you know, now he's got the haircut. We're like, put some skinny jeans on you and you are golden, you know, cause he can play the drums. <laughs> and so we were kind of joking around, like, you know, that kind of is some of the qualifications joking, like sadly, but true, true on some things. Um, not that I'm like saying that those people don't love Jesus or anything, but it's just, it is what it is. Um, Peter was qualified to speak because he is a fellow elder. Um, though Peter was clearly the prominent disciple among the 12, he claimed no special privilege or position, such as being the Pope of the early church. Instead, Peter saw himself only as one fellow elder among all elders in the church. Peter did not see himself as better than everyone. He did not see himself as like, oh, I'm the elder. Who are you? Like, um, you know, oh, peasant, get, you know, you know, he didn't do that. He was like, totally like, we are all, I mean, and if anybody, it's Peter, you know, right? Like he has. I mean, he denied Jesus three times. Let's all go back to that, you know? And so he remembers that he, he always remembered where he came from, which I love. Um, and so again, you, this is Peter writing this and everything. So um, shepherd of the flock verses two and three. Um, this was first the aspect of leadership. Peter seemed to remember Jesus's three part commission to him in John 21, 15 through seven. And in that passage, Jesus told Peter to show his love for Jesus by feeding and tending Jesus' sheep. The most important tool to shepherd the flock of God is a heart like the heart of Jesus, one that is willing to give one's life for the sheep and who genuinely cares about and is interested in them. And we see that in John 10. Okay, remember, um, Peter and John, they were with Jesus his whole ministry, so you're, he, Peter referred to that a lot, um, as, as like, as same as John, and we'll see that a lot in first John, um, verse four, those entrusted to you, the noun means a lot. And then that, which is assigned by a lot, a portion or a share of something God has assigned the various portions of his precious possession to their personal care. The idea is that God has entrusted the responsibility of the spiritual care of certain individuals to particular shepherds. Um, when the chief shepherds appears, um, Peter reminded shepherds in the church that they would answer one day to their chief shepherd, who will want to know what they did with his flock. Um, that to me would be scary as a pastor. Like I would think, oh my gosh, like, am I doing, like, I, I don't know. I would be stressed out um, just because I'd be like, you know, I want to make sure I do that because, you know, you, of course you have to answer, you know, even teachers, you know, I, I don't take that lightly as well. Um, especially with teaching this. 
study. It's like, oh, I don't want to ever mess up. I'm, but I am human. I'm going to say things that are, aren't right. And I want people to call me out on that. But um, again, this is something that they are, our pastors will have to answer to what they're like. So being a pastor is not an easy thing. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, we have these pastors and we want to put them on a pedestal, but they don't deserve to be on a pedestal because no person does. Um, but we also can't expect perfection of them, but we do need to hold them accountable. They are going to answer one day. So again, if your pastors are saying things that aren't biblically right, call them out on it. Of course, don't go up to them and say, oh, you sinner, like you're, you totally, you know, um, spiral, like messed up scripture there, you know, Ugh, how can you have done this? You know, you don't do that. You go up to them and ask them where they're coming from. Like our old pastor who I loved before he moved away, he had said some things and I just kind of one day, um, it's a weird circumstance. We were meeting the same person for lunch and that other person didn't show up. So he had said some things and I just kind of asked him because we ended up having lunch together, which was, you know, I, of course, that was awkward for me because I was like, oh, no one's else here, but we're in a public place. And I texted my husband. He's like, yeah, you're weird. Um, but because of that, I was able to have that conversation with him. And I just asked him, you know, why did you say these things on Sunday? I, it didn't sit right with me. I feel like this is the Lord, you know, having this opportunity and, um, you know, just hearing his heart and why he did it, but him also hearing, you know, my heart, he didn't get offended. He didn't throw the table at me. Um, we were able to have a very good conversation and it just opened both of our eyes to see where each other was coming from. And I love that. That's what we're supposed to call to do. Now you can have the opposite where the person's going to get offended. And if they get offended, that's on them. Like it is, if you have scripture to back up what you are saying, and you are just asking them genuinely, like, you know, that is what we are called to do. And if they get offended, that's again, like they need a heart check. Um, but it is how it is the approach. Um, again, you don't go up to them and just say like, you know, I read first Peter five and you're gonna have a lot to answer for, bud. So, you know, you don't do that. That is not where the, you know, way to go. Um, also, it is important for shepherds, pastors to realize that they lead Jesus as sheep. He is the shepherd. He is the overseer. And in this sense, we saw that in first Peter two 25. And in this sense, the Christian shepherd doesn't work for the sheep. He works for the chief shepherd. I already read that. I will be honest on this one. Um, I do feel like pastors nowadays do not look at, look at it like this. Um, I, I have been on a Paul Washer kick. If y'all know me, you know, I love Paul Washer. I listen to him like way too much. Um, but one time in his sermon, he was talking about the mega pastors and how, and he talked about you know, he wasn't like dissing the mega pastors by no means, but he was talking about small, he was comparing to those, them to the small town pastors. And he was just like, you know, I think the small town pastors have it more biblically biblical. And I was like, that's really interesting. Um, because he said, it seems like pastors do not want to be bothered by the flock that tends to have questions or issues. And, um, that's interesting because small town pastors, you know, they only have a small flock, so they're able to have that time and that attention to the people, but the big churches, you know, they, and it's no fault. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with either one. Um, I think that it's all what you prefer and everything, but I do wonder if, do the mega pastors really, do they have that opportunity, you know, to have, to know their flock? Um, and that is something where the elders come in, where in the beginning we see the elders will come in. The elders are supposed to know the flock well enough to know, hey, we have issues. Um, I remember there's a mega church here and um, I really appreciated them because the pastor, of course, didn't know all of the stuff that was going on in the church, but he noticed that a lot of the people in his church were starting to get a divorce. And he was like, wait a minute. Like, and the only reason he knew that is because the elders were telling him, Hey, we're getting a lot. And so he totally changed his sermon series to marriage, started talking about marriage and started, you know, going on. So he knew his flock well enough to change what he, of course, we have these plans, you know, they always have these sermon series planned for the next year, but he was willing to come in and say, no, that is not what we need. We need to hear, we need more marriage um, things and everything. So Again, to know your flock, knows what your flock is going through, know what you need to preach. Um, you know, use God's word to um, comfort them, direct them, guide them. And uh, so let's see here. Okay, so does anybody have anything on that section? Um, when I was listening to a service, a sermon on this section, uh, they had us go to Ezekiel 34 
and it was like verses one through 16. So it's pretty long if anybody wants to read that later on. But I thought that was a neat, um, you know, I thought it was nice to go back in there and read what they said back in the old days. Can you, uh, Carmen, do you mind putting that in the uh, comments? Sure. I think that what you said about approaching your pastor is right, that you should be able to approach your pastor. I've been struggling right now. I feel like our pastor is really discouraged with a lot of things. And I feel like I've been seeing things in our church that need changing. And actually like being frustrated to the point of, God, why won't you let me leave? Like, why can't I leave? Because I don't feel like he's given me release. Like he hasn't given me peace about that choice. And so I've been really praying about what to do because I don't want to go up and be like, well, Pastor Bobby, you're doing this and this and this wrong and you should be doing that and that and that instead of, okay, what am I willing to step up and actually do to fix this problem? And um, I, feel, I feel like God has finally like brought my husband around to certain things and stuff like that. And I feel like pieces are falling in place, but it's just been something that I don't want to dump more discouragement on him instead of like being, okay, how am I part of this problem and how can I be part of the solution? Now, Katie, we had that issue with one of the churches we went to actually where me and my husband got married at, and it was really hard. We wrestled and wrestled for years on it. And it was, um, it was really difficult. And um, I actually went to this senior pastor and talked to him. And then a few weeks later, I didn't, but the thing is, you always go to them and tell them what they're doing right as well. Don't mm -hmm. only like you don't go in and just say you're doing all this wrong. You just you suck as a person, you know, you know, you don't do that. You just kind of go in and you say, OK, this is what I see that you're doing awesome. Like, thank you for doing this, you know, and then going from that and then just saying, but I just really, you know, and again, that's where I say we went to this, I went to the senior pastor myself. But then after that, me and my husband went and talked to the associate pastor and the senior pastor and nothing got done. And we knew after that, if things weren't going to change, then that was God's releasing us from it. That was really hard. It was, it was, it was like a two year process because I always thought we were going to be here forever, you know, and that was extremely hard. Um, and, uh, but you know, it, it, you're just called to plant the seeds. God is the one that waters and grows it. And so um, don't take that lightly though, Katie, because sometimes God puts in our hearts to be able to speak. I mean, none of the prophets in the old Testament, which we're going to see next year, none of, none of the prophets were liked, you know, and they were the ones that always had to come in with the hard messages. And so that's where we have to always stand on. If God is really putting on our hearts to say something, then we need to, but we also have to be cautious of how we say it. Um, and always, always have scripture to back up to what we're saying, because if we come in with just our feelings, which I'm a feeler, then that's not really good enough. I can feel a lot of things, but those feelings aren't really biblical, but um, to make sure that what you're feeling is biblical. Katie, maybe you're, maybe him hearing it from you will be, he's like, you know how like sometimes, sometimes certain people can tell you something over and over and over, but it's that other person that tells you and it goes back to that whole there's a saying know your audience so saying what you say and how you say it i struggle with that a lot because it seems like i can't get my point across <laughs> and it drives me insane but maybe that's part of this is is she's kind of feeling leaving maybe the answer yet you didn't leave okay well why didn't i leave okay maybe i'm here oh wait now my husband agrees with me okay that's someone that if you don't want to go by yourself take your honey with you yeah. just sit down and, and just fun grammatical fact everyone don't use the word but in an argument because if you say oh i really like your shirt but i really <laughs> shoot great it actually means that you're negating everything before the word but hi that's your teacher moment for today thank you and back to you <laughs> i feel like um it's not i feel like he came with a lot of um great ideas and enthusiasm and stuff like that, but we're in a very small community in a very conservative Lutheran church. Um, and I didn't grow up that denomination. So that's another struggle that I have. Um, but I wanted, I felt like it was important for my husband and I to go to church together. And so I agreed to go to his church because we need to go together to the same church. That's important to me. And, um, and so it's just kind of like a small town Lutheran church that nobody wants to be involved and nobody wants to like get too messy up in each other's lives and whatever. And I feel like there's just missing community. And I just, 
even through the death of my mom and her long illness before I felt very loved on by my dad's church, which I used to go to before I got married and not in my church at all, zero. And so now I'm like, okay, how can we fix some of these problems that are not necessarily something that Pastor Bobby's doing wrong, but it's like a bigger symptom of a bigger issue. Katie, maybe you need to be that person. Listen and to your heart, like what you just said. And I that's was what I've been face. praying about. And my I, husband's yeah. finally on the same page. <laughs> and you are I'm like, you are so kind. And I mean, we've just gotten to know each other here. But like, think about what you just said. I was in a time of grief before. I was the caregiver for someone. Then they passed. So you need, people need people during all those seasons to where maybe that's why you didn't just up and walk. Maybe you're there to help Pastor Bobby help the people in your small community. Here, let's add more to Katie's plate, bless her heart. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the just now was so beautiful. Thank you. Oftentimes we don't see the need either until we've been through it ourselves. I mean, he may not be aware that there, I mean, he, he should be because that's his job to shepherd the flock. But a lot of times until you go through it yourself, you're not, you're not near as aware of the need Yeah. and what what it means to people. I can remember after my mom passed away and the first year, all those little all those little, the first for everything, it's so big in your life. It just is. And I can't explain it, but the anniversary of the first is too. And so now I make it a point, my friends that have a loss, I mark it in my planner that that's the one year date for their loss so that I make sure that I let them know I'm praying special for them that day that I, you know, maybe even send them a card. I know that's so old school now, but I love getting cards because it is so old school. (laughs) that kind of thing, because I know how important it is because I've been through it and I know how that touched me. And I would not know that had I not gone through it myself. And so I think to your point, Katie, I mean, I hate to throw you there to the wolves, but that may be, yeah, that may be a calling the Lord's putting on your heart. Mm-hmm. And again, you got a group here that'll help you brainstorm if you need <laughs> ideas because look I at the, it. The, our little flock here. I love our little flock. And, and again, it goes back to you, like, see what you were saying, like there there's, we can't expect perfection, but they're also men. And so they don't have the feel most of them, you know, the majority of them, they're more thinkers. So they're Katie, like they're your pastor is probably thinking numbers, numbers. How can I do this? How can I do this? I have all these ideas. I want to implement them. And then to get discouraged whenever those ideas don't get no, those don't happen because people aren't on board because people, for some reason, want the pastor to do everything whenever they can't do everything. So we see here, you know, Peter is showing, you know, this is why the elders, this is why, I mean, remember in the old Testament, whenever Moses couldn't do everything. So then he had Aaron and the judges come in and he said, you, I can't do, was it, was it Moses? And then he said, I can't do everything. So I need more people. And that's where the judges started. And so again, pastors can't do everything. We can't put them to put, do everything. Their main thing though, is, is to stay in God's word and to stay true to God's word. Like that is their main thing. Like they've got to do that. And, um, again, the sermon I was listening to this week, you know, um, Paul Washer had asked the pastor, how many, how many, like he asked the congregation because they wanted, um, a new pastor, they were getting a new pastor. And he asked the congregation, what are you expecting from your pastor? How many hours are you expecting him to do this? How many hours are you expecting to do this? Well, then by the time they said what they expected out of their pastor, they like basically wanted their pastor to work 19 hours and a day whenever he has a family and they, they, and none of it, none of what they wanted from the pastor was really being in God's word and praying for his, his, you know, church. And so that there's, that's wrong. You know, the job of a pastor is to preach God's word, to teach, to teach others. And then that's where the elders and the um, deacons and the um, people of the church come in and we come alongside of the pastor. And so, okay, it may be coming alongside that pastor and asking, how can I help you in this? Like I, you came with all these great ideas and I know you're probably discouraged because you know, honestly, the people in the church don't want to get outside of the church. They want to stay in the walls and they want to be safe and they don't want to go out. And 
but how are we going to reach the we're called to reach the unreached but we need to love those in the walls and so it's that balance of trying to figure that out um and so you know that could be really discouraging for pastors so just kind of saying okay how can i help with this but this is really on my heart and i would like your support um and everything and so it's just an idea and exactly what stacy and sue were saying so well, and to your point, Shannon, my husband, when he lost his mother and the first, the first year anniversary, I was like, you know, very gentle and ginger. And I was like, honey, are you doing okay today? I know it's one year since your mom passed away. And he was like, oh, really? I mean, it's just a lot of times men just don't, they just, they, they just don't. And he was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I need to call dad today or, well, you know, but he had not a clue. And for me, I knew a week or two coming up to it. I mean, I knew, I knew how many days it was going to be. And so for, for Katie, you know, I just, yeah, I agree with what Carmen put then we need to have, we need to keep our pastors in prayer so much, but also he, he really may be clueless. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, yeah. And Carmen, I agree completely. We need to pray for our pastors, elders, and shepherds for sure. Um, and their wives and their families, you know, it's really hard. I know a lot of pastors' wives. I walk with one of my um, good, good friends and she is a pastor's wife and just, they're, they're so, again, they're expected of so much. And sometimes their personalities aren't what <laughs> fit the pastor mold and stuff or pastor's wife mold. And so it's hard for them too. So just coming alongside of them, maybe even giving them a gift card um, to a restaurant and say, Hey, we'll watch your kids date night for y'all. Um, that would be an awesome thing too. Um, we offer that to the youth pastors at the church that we're going to now. We're like, anytime you need us to watch kids, I'm not really a kid person, but my husband and my daughter are, so they can, you know, uh, they can have fun and everything. So, um, again, I'll go buy the gift card. Um, and so you can find ways, especially there's right now with busyness, Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving busyness, you know, um, and everything. So, Okay, Stacey, if you don't mind reading verses five through seven, that would be awesome. <clears throat> In the same way, you who are younger, <laughs> submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Um, okay, these this section I absolutely love um, this section. And if you are writing cards, um, this is a great section to put in cards that, um, especially like right now with the hard times and everything. Um, I used to do part of the card like um, card ministry at the, my old church, and we would write cards to people who were going through things with a prayer request that week. And, um, that verse, I think I wrote on every card. So if they got a duplicate, sorry, I'm, I'm just not original. Um, so it's, it, it is a very great clean in the cling to whenever you are having hard times. Um, if you're going through all the first, I always say like, um, death and divorce are kind of a lot of like where it's a death, of, like divorce, you're a death of what could have been and everything. And so, um, just, this is a great reminder, um, all these verses, Okay. So verse five, humility. Okay. Not so much self-hating. Um, I looked up the, the definition of humility. Um, not so much self-hating or deprecation as self-forgetfulness and being truly others or being truly others centered instead of self-centered. Um, or sorry, humility is not so much of self-hating or deprecation as self-forgetfulness. Um, I hope that makes sense. I don't know. Um, it must have been early <laughs> um, whenever I wrote that. Okay, so I'm going to read. I have both of my Bibles here. So I'm kind of having, I've never used both Bibles. So, but I had to because there's some stuff on my Spurgeon Bible. So I'm kind of having to go both through. So excuse my craziness here. Okay, so uh, ver verse five Peter encouraged all believers to practice humility and trust God with their cares. Humility commends us to God and fellow humans, which is the opposite effect of arrogance and conceit. <clears throat> and um, humility is demonstrated by submission. It is the ability to cheerfully put away our own agenda for God's, even if God's agenda is expressed through another person. Um, here are, I looked up a few stories of humility and I thought this was um, really cool. When a man 
asked George Mueller, which I don't, I read George Mueller's autobiography, like his story. He's amazing. If you ever want to read a great autobiography, George Mueller's is the one to read. He, his story on prayer. Oh my goodness. Hashtag goals in life. He is amazing. So, um, when a man asked George Mueller, the secret of his service, Mueller responded, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will died to the world, its approval of censor, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. Wow. Like that is humility. He has given up himself and he has totally um, surrendered to the Lord. Um, so this is a quote. He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is slow, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. Yes. John, John Bunyan. Um, and then after resigning, y'all, this is this the funny quote. Um, okay, yeah, this is really funny. After resigning his pastorate to go lead another church, a pastor was approached by an elderly or an endearing older member of the congregation. She wept over the pastor's decision to leave and said, things will never be the same. The minister tried to console her by saying, don't worry, I'm confident you will get a new pastor who, who is better than me. She continued to sob and replied, that's what the last three pastors have said, but they just keep getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about hum eating some humble pie. It's like, woo. Um, I thought that was funny. So I shared it with Faith and she laughed too. I was like, Faith, this is hilarious. Um, okay, so humble yourself. So this is from my from Spurgeon and it's kind of long, but it's, you know, it's just so good. And I feel like Spurgeon really was humble. Um, he really had to give up a lot for what he believed. He really stuck with God's word. Um, I'm actually reading his autobiography now and it's amazing. And um, it, he really did go through a lot. So for him to say this, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Pride is so natural to fallen human beings that it springs up in the heart like weeds in a watered garden. We may hunt down this fox and think we have destroyed it, but our exaltation is pride. None have more pride than those who dream that they had have none. Pride is a sin with a thousand lives and a thousand shapes. By perpetual change, it escapes capture. Therefore, let us humble ourselves under the hand of God as creatures under the hand of the creator. As chasten children under a father's rod, many people have been humbled and yet they have not been become humble. There is a great difference between the two things. If God withdraws his grace and allows a Christian to fall into sin, that fall humbles him in the sight of people, and yet he may not be humble. He may never have a true sense of how evil his actions has been. He may still persevere in his pride and be far from humility. The most hopeful way of avoiding this humbling affliction is to humble ourselves. Let us be humble that way or that we may not be humbled. And so basically, you know, let us not live so prideful that God has to humble us. <laughs> and um, all throughout the Bible, we see humble leaders and prideful, prideful leaders. We will dive into that next year. But I think about Jonah, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, they were so needed hum humility. Um, and then Daniel, Hezekiah, Moses, Aaron, David, Saul, Ruth. And I think, you know, and I think of Rahab's husband, like how humbling is that? Like marrying a prostitute, you know? And so there's just so many people that we see that we saw like Nebuchadnezzar, we see that pride ruined him. He had to eat grass and um, so much so. So think of how, like, and this is hard y'all pride is so stinking hard. It is, it is, it creeps in. And, you know, pride is whenever you don't say sorry, pride is whenever you are not owning up to your sin, pride is whenever you excuse your sin. Um, I'm saying all these things because I struggle with this a lot, um, especially with my husband. Um, and it's really hard to admit when I'm wrong. Um, and so it's just, it is so hard. And then verse seven, I love this verse. And it is sure a verse, I um, like I talked about, I wrote in cards, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter quoted Proverbs 3.34 to show that humility is essential to our relationship with God. If we want to live in God's grace, his unmerited favor, then we must lay aside our pride and be humbled, not only to him, but also to one another. If you are willing to be nothing, God will make you some make something of you. 
the way to the top of the ladder is to begin at the lowest round. In fact, in the church of God, the way up is to go down. But he, but he that is ambitious to be at the top will find himself before long at the bottom. Um, again, remember where you came from. Peter did this. Peter, rem- Paul did this a lot. Paul always would say, oh, the wretched sinner that I am. He saw he was a sinner. We have to see ourselves as sinners. That's where our, that's where our humility comes in. Like God has to humble us in order for us to appreciate the cross, right? If, and again, I said this whenever we went to Japan, it was really hard to witness the people in Japan. Not that there's anything against their culture, but their culture, they don't see themselves as sinners. They don't see themselves as wrong. They very much pride themselves on being good. And so every time you go somewhere, everyone lets you go first. Every time, you know, and they, they I mean, it's just like the, no, you, no, you, no, you. Like, like, let's like, no one's ever going to go through the door because everyone wants everyone to go first because, you know, it's like, they are so for them to think oh i need the gospel is not like no i don't i'm a good person you know and so that's where it's really hard but we need to be humbled in that humility don't we see that whenever we do sin like when we sin we see our brokenness and then we can come before the lord in brokenness and in that brokenness we get to see him right and if we don't ever see the brokenness and have that brokenness in him then we don't it's like, it's like, we don't surrender to him fully. Um, and again, remember where you came from. One thing I, I try to remember all the time. I always want to remember that. Um, I, I tend to think that, especially with my job, you know, it's like, it seems like yesterday I was like, it was me, just me and Lori. And it was just, I would go to, I would go to Kroger and you put a little print up because it was before he had phone, like the smartphones and everything. I don't want to forget that. I don't want to forget where I came from. I want to remember like being a single mom and not being able to fill up my gas, my tank with gas because I can afford it. And want to be, if I can remember that, then I can remember to help the single moms that I know. And I can remember to see where, where there's a need. Um, and I don't, I, I don't want to forget that because I'm no different. I'm not a different person than, than I am now. Um, casting all your care upon him. True humility is shown by our ability to cast our care upon God. It is proud presumption to take things into our own worry and care about things that God has promised to take care of. And that's Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Okay, so I'm going to step on some toes here. There are many anxieties that we cannot cast upon God. And Peter's word here purifies us of these ungodly anxieties. Um, I am worried that I will never be rich. I am burdened that others enjoy sinful pleasures and I do not I mean anybody have that you see unbelievers and you're like well they get to do that they get to do that well I get to do that I want to do that and you're like oh um I am worried that I am not famous or even popular I mean anybody struggle with oh my goodness what do they think of me I am burdened that I cannot get revenge on those who wronged me I mean yeah I mean we want those people like David even said that in the psalm so why can't we um, and so in other words, we have to die to self, which James and Peter talked a lot about. So we have just convenient that we're reading this near the holiday season, right? Near the time that we're going to be around all of our families, we're near the time where we have to just let comments go and just say, <laughs> they just need Jesus. Um, my mom and my sister make fun of me because every time they say something, they mock me and say, well, they just need Jesus, don't they, Shannon? And I'm like, yes, they do. They need Jesus um, because that is my saying. If people are rude or mean, they just need Jesus. Um, and so try not to focus on what others have or what you do not have, but be thankful for what you do have. Um, again, we've talked about this a lot, especially in the Daily Post. You know, it's just a struggle, um, you know, but again, we are to cast our anxieties on God. You know, we are not, we fear has come in fear. I 2020 and 2021 is like the years of fear, right? We have fears of everything, fear, fear, fear. Um, Satan is coming in through fear. We will fear for everything. Um, and we should not, right. We should hand those things to God, you know, and say, okay, Lord, I'm fearful of this. I worry about this, but I want to hand this to you. I don't want fear to come in and get the best of me. Um, because in the, in fear, we did end up making, like, we just end up doing things that we would never have done if not fear. And I say that because I, I, I have done that, you know, especially, um, being fearful. Of things. So anybody have anything on that section? I, um, hi, I'm Larissa. I'm brand new. Hey, Larissa. Um, <laughs> and I'm also driving home from picking up my dad's groceries. <laughs> oh. Um, 
when when people are doing things that we can't do and when 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 people are uh, you said when people are doing things that we can't do and it causes anxiety and why can't I, why can't I, when people are doing those things and when people are being ugly to you or mean to you, that's when they need prayer. The thing that you do is pray for those people, not, not um, compare yourself to those people because Jesus says you don't compare yourself to anyone. We don't judge. God calls us to love that is the thing that we do. We love one another. We know that as Christians, as, as born again Christians, we know that some things just aren't right. We know that whatever God made, whatever he made, however he made, it was good. And he liked it because he said so. Um, it's not for us to to judge and it's not for us to decide and it's not for us to point out or anything like that um it's it's for us to to love for us to pray for those people for us to show them love and hospitality and to show them how we live when when people, when you're around people who don't read their Bible, they read you. However you act, however you, however you respond to certain, to certain things going on in the world, things that you say, the way that you, the way that you react, people read you. Um, that's just life. We know that we're not supposed to compare ourselves to anyone. We know that we're not supposed to want for things. Um, however, we're human. And to be human is to sin. And one sin is as bad as another sin. If, if you're comparing yourself to someone or if you're doing some of those actions that um, you were talking about that you have a hard time with. And I know there are things that I have a hard time with. There are things that everyone has a hard time with, but a sin is a sin is a sin. It's all, it's all up to God to judge, not us. And we'll see. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, we'll we'll see that a lot next week in First John. First John, you're going to see a whole lot of that. We're going to talk a lot about that. So, um, uh, everything that you're saying, Larissa, is we will hit in First John for sure. It's full of goodness, for sure. Sorry, it, I may have jumped ahead of you then. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. You're totally good. Does anybody else have anything on that section? I, I don't know about you, Shannon, but I find when I do, I am willing to be humbled for the Lord, that that's when I see him working through me in more mightier ways than any other time. Um, I struggled with <laughs> something earlier this week, um, another Bible study I attend, and she texted me ahead of time and asked me if I'd be willing to share on an area that I had had a struggle in that the Lord had given me victory on. And I was like, man, the Lord, it's just like the Lord blocked that out of my total mind. And the only thing he gave me in my, that came to my mind was something I was still struggling with. And I was like, but Lord, do I really want to put myself out there? In fact, I was like, I'm not even sure I can get through that without crying about it. And I was like, really is you are you really asking me to do this and so I texted her back and I was like I'm not sure this is what you're gonna what you really want because I had don't have victory over that yet and I'm something I really struggle with and so you you may want somebody else to do that whatever and she was like oh no that sounds just fine you just feel free to share and she said I'll open into open into questions and if you still feel comfortable go ahead and share anyway I shared and I got a call afterwards and said, I just want you to know that's something I'm struggling with too. And I just want you to know that that talked to me today. And I was like, you know, 
talk about humble. That humbles you even more. Oh, Lord, you, you were using me because I was willing to put myself out there. And um, pardon? Well, I was going to say that, and that's humility because you put yourself out there and you show that you don't have it all together. And, oh, no. You no. Know, <laughs> and, um, I never want to come across as I have it all together because I'm nowhere near having it all together. Same. But, but yeah, and I didn't get through it without crying, but I was like, oh, well, you know, if the Lord asked me to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to do it because if he can use me, then that's what we're here for. Yep. Very cool. Um, Barbara said, I heard a pastor say I is in the middle of pride. <laughs> so true. Um, verse, and then Carmen said, verse seven, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Um, and I think Carmen, that is such a, it is so true. Whenever you have those anxious anxiety and these anxious thoughts and everything, he wants us to come to him. You know, that's where he wants us to desire him in those. And, um, he gives us all we need now. I mean, he does call us to go to others like Sue, like the way you did, you know, that person was able to come to you and say, yeah, I struggle with that too. Um, and y'all can, get, you can have each other to hold each other accountable, but ultimately we go to the Lord and he either brings people in our path, um, or he gives us words, scripture to, you know, go to, or a sermon or music or something. Um, however it speaks to us, um, and everything. So it's very cool. Well, and I also felt like the Lord gave me so much. I mean, I mean, I'm like on the over, over side, over side of the hill on that struggle just by sharing. And I, that's crazy. I don't even understand how that works, but it's like, yeah, it was really, really crazy. I think that that's that because whenever you own it, then Satan can't keep reminding you of it. And so, and that's, that's where I did with my abortion. The minute I started telling people about my abortion, I was like, I'm free from that. I'm free from that. Like I'm no longer in bondage. God forgave me of that. And now I don't, I, I don't have, it's not a secret sin anymore. I think right. those secret sin through those secret sins that we have, it's like insane to me how Satan will just remind you of it. Oh, look at you. You're so bad. Oh, look at you. Look what you did. Oh, look at what you struggle with. Oh, and you call yourself a Christian, you know, those voices that he has, you know, that he reminds you of. Um, and then once you own it, you're like, you know what? Yeah, I am a sinner and I am struggling with that, but you know what? God is bigger. God wins. I hate to tell you God wins. So every time that, you know, but the minute you own it and that you say it out loud, Sue, it's just like, yeah, I do struggle with that. And then like Satan, oh, now I got to find something else, you know? And so, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, I don't know. That's where humility is, Sue. I mean, that's, that's humility is humility is owning your sin. It's owning your sin and saying, I can't do this alone. I can't go through this alone. I have to have the Holy spirit. I have to have the Holy spirit help me and guide me in this. Um, well, and there's also the strength in numbers that, you know, that yep. you can, someone called you and said, Hey, I'm struggling with this too. And that's happened to me over and over. But just to have that community and the strength and numbers to pray for each other and help each other through it, I think is so valuable and something that we fear to share our true selves with people. But when you actually do open up, that God can use that. And I think that that's a fear just sent by the devil to discourage us and keep us separated. Yeah. Because we think we're the only ones, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Toxic positivity. Toxic positivity. I wanted to share too a uh, study that I'm doing. It's it is about abortion, but it can really be applied to any sin that we've struggled with now or in the past. Um, the thought of being exposed or found out terrifies us. Most likely, fear of exposure of the pregnancy or the factor in choosing abortion in the first place. That's one reason why many women have guarded their secret for years. But consider this: Whom do we really protect by holding on to the secret? We're covering up the deceiver's lie that abortion or whatever sin doesn't hurt people. And we're reinforcing society's belief that we're unaffected by the choices. Mm. Remaining silent keeps us in the darkness of life, but freedom comes in exposing, exposing it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that gives me chills. So true. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Um, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so Stacy, do you want to go ahead and get read the rest of the chapter because we're going to move on so we can get through um, the overview as well. Sure. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist 
against him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Final greetings. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Okay, so verses eight and nine, Peter warned believers to be aware of Satan's deceitful practices and to resist them firmly. Exactly what we were just talking about. Such behavior is fitting for temporary residents on this, of this world. Peter strengthened his readers with the knowledge that the other Christians were also suffering. The devil certainly walks about. He is a finite, finite being and can only be in one place at one time, yet his effort, energy, and associates enable him to extend his influence all over the world and in every arena of life. Resist. Be more prayerful every time he is more active. He will soon give it up. If he finds that his attacks drive you to Christ, often has Satan been nothing but a big black dog to drive Christ's sheep nearer to the master from Spurgeon. Um, exactly what we just talked about, Sue. Exactly. Um, and, and exactly what Brittany had just read. Um, it goes, it, it's just so true. God will strengthen and honor in heaven those who endure suffering for their faith while on earth. Goodness, this is so comforting. And it's like, yet again, nothing in this world matters. All that matters is Christ. Um, again, we need to pray for those in Haiti, um, all of those in Haiti right now that are going through suffering right now, they are going through true suffering, um, um, by being believers verse 10, it is glory of the enjoyment of God himself. I love that. Do we just enjoy God? Is there times where you just enjoy him right now at the season, there's a road that we go down and I actually had faith take a picture. I was going to show it, but I don't remember where it's at. Um, I'll have to share it into the, um, YouTube or whenever I put the post this on there and it's just beautiful it's just the most beautiful thing and it's like every time we go just like I drive her to school I'm like or anywhere and we're down that road I'm like faith it's just so beautiful how do people not enjoy God's beauty like he gives us this and it's just so beautiful and um just enjoy him enjoy his word like dig into his word and enjoy it don't like like it's so sad I was talking to this guy yesterday at Kroger and like he was like, we talked for a long time. He was just a young guy. He's a rapper. He told me to go listen to young thug. I was like, yeah. Do you think this white middle-aged woman is going to listen to young thug and like it? You know, like, come on, let's just be real. Um, but I, you know, it's just like what I, I just wanted him to see that you can enjoy God's word. You can enjoy who God is, you know? And, um, and he, it was just like, he just looked at me like it was foreign, foreign to him, but that's what he wants. He wants us to enjoy it. Once we enjoy it, it becomes part of us, right? Once we have God's word in, in us, then we um, enjoy him more. We don't look at it as a chore to come to God's word. We look at it like, oh, I get to go to God's word. Like, this is awesome. So it's just enjoying him. And then verses 12 through 14, Silas may have helped Peter write this letter as his secretary but more likely he was a letter carrier. Paul conveyed greetings to his readers from the church in Rome, from the church in Babylon, and also from Mark, my son, Peter's son in faith, not his biological son. The kiss of love was a customary form of greeting in the first century church. Peace is a sense of well-being and blessedness that the believers have because of their relationship with Christ. This bene benediction is an appropriate ending to the letter because when Christians are being persecuted on earth, heaven's peace cannot be taken from them. Okay, let me say that again. When Christians are being persecuted on earth, heaven's peace cannot be taken from them. Let that sink in. The peace of Christ cannot be taken from you, if, if you unless you allow it to be taken from you. I mean, you have to allow it, right? So whenever those anxieties and those, all of those things that we struggle with, whenever we have peace in the Lord, if that's taking away, you're letting that. And so again, that firm, full armor of God, which I'm going to keep on saying, put it on and just remind yourself, God is in control. No matter what you're going through, God is in control and that 
you just ask for peace for him to give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. Let him guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So whenever you go through those things, let your heart be guarded, let your mind be guarded in him and in his word. And the only way you can do that is being in his word um, and being in relationship with him and relationship with other believers to remind you of that. So does anybody have anything on that? Again, Satan, we have to remember he is there. He is real, but he also, we cannot give him too much credit. He cannot be everywhere at once. People always say that again. I say he's probably not going to be around us. Y'all I'm just be honest. There's some humility. We are not like, you know, he's going to be around people like, you know, Billy Graham and like all of those people, like, you know, the big people that have, you have way more influence, but his demons, his they are all over, you know, and they are out to kill, still and destroy. They're out to devour us. They're out to make us question God. They're out to make us, you know, put temptation in our way and everything. But the thing is, is, you know, again, if it draws us just like this quote that Spurgeon said, you know, if it's going to bring us closer to Christ, then he's going to give up, right? They're going to give up. Um, and, you know, we may give in to that temptation, but what are we going to do with that? If we repent and turn to God, then you know, we're coming to him and we're coming closer to him. So anything, having anybody have anything on that last section before I go over the first John overview? Nothing. Okay, I closed my Bible too soon. Okay. So I'll go over first John overview since y'all are don't have anything on that section. Okay, so who wrote the book, First John, Second John, and Third John? Actually, John writes the rest of the New Testament. The rest of what we're going to be reading, John writes it. So we're going to see all of John's letters, except for, wait, do we have Jude? He didn't write Jude, though. Um, okay, so John of Zebedee, who wrote the book of John, John and James, his older brothers, were known as the sons of Zebedee. And you see that in Matthew 10, two through four, whom Jesus gave the name sons of thunder, Mark 3, 17. John was one of the three most intimate associates with Jesus, along with Peter and James, being an eyewitness to a and participant in Jesus's earthly ministry. In addition to the three epistles, John also authored the fourth gospel in which he identified himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved and as the one who reclined on Jesus's breast at the Lord's Supper, he also wrote the book of Revelation, um, which y'all, I cannot, I, I have to say, I'm just not excited about teaching that one because that's going to be a hard one. <laughs> that's going to be real fun. Um, and it's coming up on us very quickly. Um, okay, so the contribution of the Bible, like who, what, what is the purpose? What did this do? What did First John do for us? First John maps out the three main components of saving knowledge of God, faith in Jesus Christ, obedient response to God's commands. And like Larissa was talking about earlier, love for God and others from the heart. The epistle shows how Jesus expects his followers to honor him in pract practical church life and wherever God calls his people to go and serve. Um, the constant repetition of the three sub themes reinforce the overall theme regarding faithfulness to the basics of Christianity, happiness, holiness, and security. Mm -hmm. By faithfulness to the basic, his readers will experience these three results continually in their lives. These three factors also reveal the key cycle of truth spiritually in 1 John. A proper belief in Jesus produces obedience to his commands, obedience issues, and love for God and fellow believers. When these three sound faith, obedience, and love operate in concert together, they result in happiness, holiness, and assurance. They constitute the evidence, the litmus test of a true Christian. When was this written? It was written about 70 AD and um, secondary or second century sources reported that around AD 70, the year of Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. John left Jerusalem where he was a church leader and relocated to Ephesus. He continued his pastoral work in the region and lived until nearly AD 100. Ephesus is probably the place where John wrote the three New Testament letters that bear his names. They could have been composed at any time in the last quarter of the first century. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then he was in Ephesus when he wrote this. I didn't know that. So that's just really interesting to me. Um, and then like, why, why did he, why did he write all these books? John made four purpose statements. First, he wrote to promote his readers fellowship and joy. We are writing these things so that you, that our joy may be complete. 
Second, he wrote to help other or, or help readers avoid the pitfall of sin, yet find forgiveness when they stumble. My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may ha not sin. And then third, he wrote to protect believers from false teachers. I have written these things to you about those who are destroying to deceive you. Finally, he wrote so that they may know that they have eternal life. I have written these things for you to believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This last purpose statement governs the other three and brings them together in a unifying theme. In summary, 1 John was written to confirm Christians and true apostolic Christianity by helping them avoid the destructive beliefs and behaviors to which some had fallen prey. This book is going to be so prevalent to right now. I mean, it just is. It's going to be great for us to read right now too. Um, it's just a great time to um, just remember, especially it's going to come right at the time that you're going to be around everyone and your family and your God to love, 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 love. <laughs> so you're going to hear that over and over and over and over. So what perfect timing to be reminded, you know, God's timing is perfect. So there you go. He's going to remind you love, love. So what you're saying is we should stock up on coats because apparently we're going to be giving a lot of coats out. Because of the scripture of it's if the person does you wrong, you wrap up your coat and you I give hope, it to them. Hope, hope. Say, I read my Bible. I now can say funny little witty. I did that on a customer <laughs> service call. I was on a I was on the phone with a customer for almost an hour the other day. And it was kind of one of those things where I realized there's been so much disconnection in the last two years that even just a simple phone conversation, I know more about this man's life. He was born and raised in Louisiana. He lived in New Orleans. He was a victim of Hurricane Katrina. He has PTSD from it. He now lives in Texas. He's a truck driver that drives 264 miles round trip every day. He was calling about a product. I explained to him about the product, but then he kept telling me about his sons and we talked about light and it was like a conversation for an hour. And it was finally one of those things. And I realized I'm like, I quoted scripture so many times during that call and I was so excited to get on here so I could tell y'all, <laughs> but it was so, it was like a believer to a believer. There's no way besides work that you would have ever spoken to each other. And it was just this whole thing that it was just so encouraging in going back to your point on all the fear mongering that's gone on for the last two years. People just want connection with people and Believers that connect with believers are, to me, that's just a bonus. Yeah, for sure. It, it was just one of those things that was out of nowhere, but it was, I don't know. It was like, I think that going back to kind of all the different touch points from today, whether it's, you know, you're seeing something on social media, it makes you feel some kind of way. Well, it makes you feel some kind of way typically because you're not happy with that in your life. So it's like, then you got to kind of take that humbleness, take a step back and go, okay, why why did that make me feel that way? Oh, that's because I'm not happy with this. Well, what can I do to work on this? And I think that's where so much of it is, as opposed to just getting upset and running away, you know, but like I said, at the end of the day, it's just be kind. I mean, I literally have it on my desk as a reminder, but be kind to others, but be kind to yourself. I think yeah. that's the biggest thing for a lot of us is we've carried, we carry the burden or we are the people pleasers, or we are the one that does everything for everyone all the time. And at the end of the day, you have to really be kind to yourself. Correct. You know, and especially like when it comes to, I've heard, and I've heard this from a lot of people. Oh, I don't have any time to read the Bible. Oh yes, you do. You just have to make it happen. You know, that you don't care where you are. It's kind of the thing that I found is it's like, you just work it into your day however you can, whether it's just having this fantastic book on your desk or on your phone or mine reads to me. I enjoy being read to. So that's what I do in the morning is I, as I'm reading back through the Bible, it's like, I, I have it read to me. So it's like, and that's something selfish that I do for myself every day. Well, you were talking about being kind to yourself. I say so many things to myself that I would never say to a single other person in my life because it's so awful. It'll like, change your life when you real. stop talking to yourself that way. Absolutely. Work on I, it. 
it yeah, changed I have my been, life radically. Yeah, recognizing it. And I've been trying to implement it in my kids' lives. And like my daughter's been experiencing a lot of anxiety. My son told me that I'm, you know, I'm always bad at home. And I'm like, okay, but you are a kind boy and you are loving and like, just let's speak truth and speak into existence things that I want to see in him. <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. Um, Katie, I don't know if we will have study next week, but watch, are, is everyone signed up for emails? The emails mm -hmm. that I send out? Okay, just watch for that. I'll probably send out an email Sunday morning or su Sunday sometime maybe or Monday morning and just kind of give you a heads up what day that if I do end up doing one next week. Juanita, do you have something? Do you want to say something? Because your little hand is up. So Oh, you're on mute. So I can't hear you. So, but you don't have anything. Okay. I saw your hand up and I was like, do you have something? I don't want to. I don't want no, to. I don't. Um, okay. No, I'm just fidgety today for some reason. <laughs> okay. I wanted to just kind of comment or add to what Stacy had said about how people say they don't have time to read the Bible. Our pastor put it like this. So if you're going to make time for your family, for your friends, um, you need to make time for Jesus because he mm -hmm. wants to have a relationship with you. So, and we become more like the people we spend time with. So that's something to think about too. Um, and then what Katie said about things that she says to herself, I'm really guilty of doing that too. And um, I was going somewhere with that and then it just went off. It's gone now <laughs> because oh, that's what happens sometimes. <laughs> oh, so. Hey, you're you're you need to be, be kind to yourself because <laughs> you have so much on your mind. You got derailed, but it'll come that's back to you, but be kind to yourself. <laughs> there you go. Perfect lesson. I think it's just reminding yourself of scripture, just telling yourself scripture over and over. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, if it's just the, that simple scripture, yeah. that just a reminder, um, new but at work i'm allowed to listen so i probably won't unmute but really enjoying this time oh we're so glad i don't think it, your name's probably not ed or is it i don't know so okay um we're glad you're here and we're glad y'all joined you and larissa joined today um but we are going to go ahead and pray us out so we can um head out i got a lot of work to do i guess i've been behind all week um but Give yourself grace. Yeah, I do. Oh, I, That's an opportunity. Girl, I have no guilt on that grace. at all. It's been beautiful here weather. And I'm like, look, I'm enjoying the weather. Like it's just been, and then today, of course, I knew it today was going to be rainy. So I was like, it's going to rain all day Thursday. I'll just catch up then, you know, um, Ed is my, I'm Don. Okay. Don, nice to meet you. That's my middle name. So, um, awesome. Okay. Y'all, does somebody want to pray us out? And again, watch for emails. If we do next week, I'll let y'all know if, it will most likely be Tuesday, though, if we end up doing a day a day next week. But there's just so much good reading, so it's really hard to it's just. Uh, so it's gonna be hard to pick, but that'll give me at least. What did that give me? Today's I don't remember how the reading went, but Friday's reading or Monday's reading or Tuesday's reading. So I'm sure I can pick one of those chapters if we do, or an upcoming chapter, and we can just do it in advance. So I'll just let y'all know though if we do end up doing it. Um, Lori, thank you so much for joining. You're new too. Um, we're so glad you. We're so glad y'all are here. So, okay. Yes. Does anybody want to close us in prayer? I can if my kids will be quiet enough, but they're having a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Katie. Anyway, oh Lord, I just thank you so much for this group and what a blessing it's been, and all these ladies who show grace and kindness and love, and um, I just thank you for wanting to have a relationship with us. And I pray that you would help us to go forth in our week and be humble and show your love to people and look for those God opportunities and the way that you show up in our lives. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank y'all. Y'all have a great week. And have a good Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye.